All right, let's start. So today is all about uh, TLS. I'm just going to spend a couple minutes at the beginning finishing up the SQL injection stuff that we didn't get to last time. So we'll go, go to these slides here. All right, so uh, I concluded last time with this, this little script I wrote that was doing that sort of uh, the, what was it called, a time-based blind SQL injection. Um, uh, and the, the idea there was, remember, we had this SQL query that took a different amount of time depending on um, uh, this like, uh, string here that we injected that takes a little bit of time to run. We were able to use that, that timing difference to extract uh, information. In particular, we extracted a, a password out of the database. Um, and I just wanted to use th this example to point out just that, that um, even if you think that um, you know, a, a SQL injection isn't uh, exploitable by the user because it's not resulting in the user being able to control something that you know, gets displayed by the web page, there's still sort of these other ways that SQL injection can, can, get, can uh, bite you. And so let's talk about sort of what, what's the core problem here with, with SQL injection. The cause is we have, uh, we're using our application server, which is our server code, to decide what queries to run on our database. And it's important then, if we're doing this, that our server uh, ensures that, the, that our users of our website are, are only able to make queries that make sense for the permissions that that user has uh, on our site. And so we run into problems if the user can sort of modify this query, the SQL query, and, and create whatever query they want. Um, so you could imagine a different design where the sort of access control isn't happening in the web application, but instead the database has some notion of who are all the different users on our website, and the database itself might be able to enforce access to different rows in the tables and different tables in the database, right? This is just another possible way you could architect this. But um, typically for sort of ease of uh, development, we, we just sort of let the web server just look at whatever rows in the database at once, whatever tables in the database at once, and we just hope that our team of people who are coding this server are doing a good job in, in ensuring that the correct user only accesses the, the data that they're allowed to access. So there's something to think about. If, if, if it's really bad that, you know, uh, if a user were to access data they're not supposed to see, then maybe we could use a different design than this. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, and just talk about a few solutions to SQL injection. So like the other uh, stuff we've seen, we want to escape user input when we're producing these queries. And so the, the sort of standard way to do this is parameterized SQL. Uh, and there's also another option you have called object relational mappers, or ORMs. And uh, the, the, the idea here is just never, ever build your own SQL queries using uh, string concatenation. You should call a function that's going to combine the untrusted user input with the, the uh, query that you want to run and sort of insert the user uh, input in the correct place. And so here's an example of this. So if we're doing parameterized SQL, you'll notice that um, this is the same query that we, that we used uh, before that was vulnerable. And this is vulnerable because we're relying on this sort of, um, this is the JavaScript uh, template string syntax with these backticks here. And what this does is it sort of just looks at um, any variable here in this, uh, in this lexical scope called username and just sort of dumps it right in there and uh, replaces everything from the dollar sign to the, to the bracket with that, uh, that variable. And of course, this is a problem because the user can put anything they want in there. And so a safe way to do this is we swap out that with just a question mark. Um, and then we call um, the same function, but we pass it the untrusted user input as additional arguments. And now it's the job of this db.all function to take that untrusted user input, escape it correctly for the context where it's going to get inserted, and then it's going to insert it where it finds a question mark. Right? And um, if we just do this, then we're fine. This is called parameterized SQL, and no matter what sort of SQL library you're using, it's going to come with some kind of functionality like this. Cool. So that's, that's one way to do it. The other way is uh, ORMs. So an ORM is, it's not, its primary purpose is not to do uh, sort of escaping user input for you, but you sort of get that as a, as a tangential benefit. Um, typically, people want to use ORMs when they're trying to just create a different way of, they, they want a, an easier way to access the data in their database. And so the idea is normally da data in databases is, is composed of rows or relations. And we want to, um, because we're, we're writing our code in an object-oriented program, we typically want to represent each row of the database as an object in our object-oriented programming language. And so if we use an ORM, we can sort of pretend like, you know, this, this person's table in our database uh, has, you know, uh, we have this object person that we can work with to, to um, uh, uh, 
that's just sort of an object in our, in our language, but in fact, it's sort of mapped in the, in the back end to a row in the database. Uh, and so like, if, with that, we could do something like this, where we could say, we want to sort of query our, our, our users table where the username matches this and the password matches this. And of course, because we're using these, these functions, it, they're gonna, it's going to escape the, the untrusted user input for us here. Cool. So yeah, uh, maybe you've seen one of those before. But anyway, so those are the two options you have. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, why not? Why can't you just use uh, MongoDB as an aggregation layer? When, but it, would that solve many of? I think that would solve many of the SQL injection problems. So you still have the same problem if you're composing queries that are that are combined with user uh, input that's not trusted, because you still have to make a query to this to this to this database, and it just so happens that your query might take the form of of a of a query object in the NoSQL case instead of a query string, but it's still, if you're letting the user select the, the, that, that object like however they want, you're letting them provide you the object, maybe they're sending you some JSON or something, then you're gonna have the same problem because now they can select whatever they want out of your, out of your NoSQL database. Mm -hmm. Could you adopt the same solution when you use like an ORM like MongoDBs and then um, like solve the same problem? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, yeah, if you're, using, if you're using something on top of your database, typically it's going to provide these, these faculties for you. In fact, I don't, know, I don't know what Mongo provides out of the box. It might also provide some way of escaping this input. But yeah, in general, if you're just taking sort of whatever the user gives you and just sticking it in a query, you're going to have problems. But yeah, Mongo, I think Mongoose handles that for you. Yeah. Cool. All right, so let's keep going. So anyway, just, this is sort of the end of the SQL part. So just the key things to remember about SQL injection are that the, the attack happens like when you're in the same way as all the other attacks we've talked about of this sort, combining untrusted input with query strings. And the simple solution is just remember, use parameterized SQL um, to, to sanitize your input. Cool, so now we'll get on to today's topic of TLS. So TLS is, this is cool. So it's, uh, it's not the area I'm most comfortable, so I'm gonna do my best uh, today. But um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really cool stuff. Uh, and there's, there's all kinds of attacks. Uh, and uh, uh, TLS solves a bunch of attacks, but also itself has, has some, uh, some, some ways you can use it wrong. And so we're going to talk about all the ways that it can be used wrong and what you need to do to make sure your site is secure. So the, 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 the core problem here is HTTP has, has, has a big weakness. Um, you often hear that HTTP is not secure. Um, and when you visit an HTTP site, even these days in Chrome, you'll see that it tells you it's not secure. You'll see the little not secure indicator next to the, the URL in the address bar. And uh, the question is, why? Why is it not secure? So uh, let's quickly review HTTP request response and see exactly what's going on here. So in a typical uh, unencrypted HTTP uh, uh, situation, we're going to have the client. This is the browser making a request. And say it's uh, a post request to log into a website. So it sends the request to the server. And the server sends back, after checking the username and password, it sends back a, a, a response that includes a cookie. Uh, and so in HTTP, this is, of course, all this is visible to anyone who's on the network. And so uh, what could happen is uh, the network here is you know, every, any router you're connected to or any um, uh, ISP that you're, that you're using. And so, uh, so, so let's say that, uh, that uh, somebody on that network, uh, we call them a passive attacker in this case, uh, wants to observe this, this traffic, then, then they can literally watch you know, the, those requests and responses as they go by. So in this case, this request uh, from the client goes through the passive attacker, and the attack passive attacker is passive. They don't do anything to the request. They sort of let it go along, but they observe it. And so they see your username and password in this request here. Uh, and then similarly, the, the uh, server's response also passes back to the passive attacker, and so they also observe your, your session cookie. All right, so this is, uh, this is not good. Um, so we want to we fix this problem. Oh, yeah, I guess also there's, there's an even worse situation, which is where you have an active attacker. So we should talk about that. So, an active attacker is willing to uh, actually do something to the requests and responses that it sees going by. It's willing to modify them. Um, it's uh, a little bit harder to, to pull this off, but um, it's, there's actually out-of-the-box software you can install on like, a, on like a router, and you can set this router up at, you know, at a coffee shop, and whoever connects to it is, is going to, you know, your active code is going to run, and you can, you can do like what, what we'll show here. So it's actually not, it's, it's harder, but it's not that hard. Um, so let's, let's, take a, let's take a look here. So say the client is just going to request a home page of a website, sends a get request. The active attacker just, for this request, lets it go through unmodified. The server sees it and responds with some HTML. And remember, for the, from this server's perspective, this is the client it thinks it's talking to, right? So this is acting like a proxy server. Uh, and then the active attacker 
uh, uh, goes ahead and modifies the HTML that it got back from the, the server and adds in its own, uh, let's say, its own JavaScript that, that's going to sort of change the behavior of the page in some way, steal your information, or, um, or you know, do whatever the attacker wants to do on this page. And so it'll forward that back along to the client with the evil HTML included. And so now the, this client you know, has no idea that this happened, and it's going to think that this is the, you know, it doesn't know that it's, it's, it's not talking to the real server. Cool. So any questions about this? All right, so, so the threat model here, the thing we're worried about in both of these examples is, that, is a network attacker. A network attacker is anyone who controls any infrastructure. It could be, you know, the example I used earlier was routers or your ISP, but it could even be like, um, you can think of, the, of a malicious DNS server also as a network attacker, because if the malicious DNS server responds with an IP address of not the correct server, but its own server, you're going to go and talk to that server instead, and it sort of has the same effect um, as, as, uh, as, as if that attacker controlled the router. Um, and if they're passive, they can eavesdrop on everything that goes on, or if they you know, even want to be more active than that, they can inject additional packets, they can prevent certain packets from being, being sent, they can modify packets, they can change the timing of packets, there's all kinds of different things they can do. They can basically play with the tr network traffic any way they want to. Um, okay, so, um, and then, yeah, of course, I guess I already mentioned the wireless networks at cafes or hotels, but there's also um, any place where your traffic crosses a national border is another place where traffic can be played with. So those border gateways also have, uh, have um, sort of all, all the same pitfalls, and a network attacker can sort of play with traffic there as well. Cool. So our goal here is we want to uh, have secure communication um, in the presence of these network attackers. And so specifically, we want these three properties, privacy, integrity, and authentication. So privacy is no eavesdropping. So that sort of pre prevents passive attackers from seeing what we're doing. Um, and on top of that, we want to ensure that the messages haven't been tampered with, uh, right? Because if you could tamper with the response, even if you couldn't see it, if you could tamper with it, now you're going to potentially be running the attacker's JavaScript in, um, you know, in the response there, because the attacker can tamper with that HTTP response. Uh, and then lastly, authentication. This is really important. You need to know that you're actually talking to who you think you're talking to. It turns out if you don't have authentication, you don't have any of the other three things, right? Like, what's, what good is it to, to be communicating with an attacker privately and with integrity? You're still talking to the attacker, right? So, so it, you know, all these, all these are really important. You need all three. Um, so we're going to talk about how to get all these three things uh, using TLS. But yeah, first of all, any, any questions about this? Cool. All right. So, all right, so let's, let's run through um, an example here. So, this is kind of what we want. Uh, we're going to start off really high level here. Just sort of, I'm representing a secure uh, connection that, <laughs> that has all those properties we want with this little green box with a lock in it. And so we want to be able to sort of somehow send our request to the server. Notice the attacker is still here, right? The at we're, still, we're still potentially using an untrusted router or an untrusted internet service provider. We might be talking to a site in another country. So we still have, you know, these network attackers still exist, but somehow we still want the protocol to ensure that we, uh, we get those three properties in the presence of that attacker, right? So, the way that works is the, the attacker sees the request, and uh, in this case, let's say it forwards it on, right? Um, you might say maybe, maybe the attacker sees this, this request. And, uh, by the way, to be clear, it doesn't actually see the, the text inside that box. This box is sort of like, an, you know, it's representing sort of encrypted. It's, imp it's impervious to the attacker. The attacker can't see what's in that box. Um, the attacker has a choice here. They could sort of not forward this on and just sort of say, no, you're not going to, like, we're not going to forward that on, and that, that would appear to the user as, as sort of the site is down. So the attacker still has that option if they're literally your internet service provider or they're the router that you're connected to, right? Um, so that's sort of something that's available to them, but, um, uh, but of course you will probably move to another cafe or, or switch internet companies if this happens to you. Um, so yeah, so the attacker decides to forward it on in this case, and uh, the server sends back a response, and of course the attacker's only option again is to either maybe not send it, not forward it along to you, but it, there's nothing else it can do. So um, in, the, in the normal case, it'll, it'll forward it along to you and it, it learns nothing. Um, Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it still learns the IP address of the server you're connected to, right? Uh, because uh, all, of this, uh, all this sort of in TLS stuff that we're showing here happens at a level that's sort of on top of, uh, on top of uh, IP. So um, all these packets are going to have destinations attached to them, the IP address of the server we're talking to. So that's still going to be visible to the attacker, uh, but that's sort of, uh, yeah. It learns the size of the messages. That's right. Yeah, it learns it learns sort of the timing between the messages. It I guess that's true. There's all these kinds of potential side channels here. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. But um, 
those are sort of outside of the scope of what we're like trying to solve. We, we're not trying to solve that here. Cool. So, uh, oh yeah, the last thing we have to check here is, uh, of course, we want to confirm that this response actually came from example.com. Um, so, uh, if the client uh, gets this sort of this response here and uh, just sort of trusts that it happened to be talking to example.com, that that might not be a correct assumption, right? It could be that this whole exchange happened with the you know like the attacker could have sort of sent back something else, right? Um, and so that's that's a really important check to make sure that this response actually comes from who we think it's going to come from. And so we're going to talk about how that happens uh, a bit later. But just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's so let's uh, let's sort of define sort of what is TLS here. So TLS is what the, that whole thing I just showed is. Um, now, uh, when TLS is used with HTTP, we call it HTTPS. So the underlying encryption pro pro protocol is called TLS, but sort of the whole package with TLS plus HTTP is HTTPS. Uh, because, because TLS can be used with a bunch of other things. It can be used with email, um, instant messaging, VoIP, uh, a ton of other protocols, really. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, that's, so that's HTTPS. Um, and so now, I want to talk about uh, sort of the, the first kind of primitive that we need to, um, to communicate securely with a server. Um, so I'm not going to go too, too much into detail here because um, I think if you want to know more about this, you should take CS255, um, which is Intro to Crypto, which is a really, really great class. Um, and they go like way into detail about this, uh, this kind of stuff, all these different crypto primitives. But um, we're going to state like a relatively high level here. So, so let's talk about anonymous Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So we call this anonymous uh, because we, uh, in this protocol I'm about to show, we don't do any authentication of the server that we're talking to. So this is not uh, this this protocol here is not going to protect us from an active attacker who's actually willing to modify packets. What this is going to do is just uh, ensure that a passive eavesdropper doesn't learn anything. Okay? And we're going to add in the, the, the extra, we're going to fix that problem uh, in, in another step. Okay, so let's start off here. We have a browser in the server. And so uh, we have uh, this notion of a cyclic group. Um, so a cyclic group is, the level I want to keep it at here is just think of it like a set of numbers. Um, and uh, you, know, you see here like 1G, G squared, G cubed. G is just a number. Um, G is publicly known, and it's sort of defined in the standard. Uh, that, so it's, it's something that everybody who, you know, the browser makers, the attackers, and the servers, everybody knows what G is. Um, and we can, we can do group operations on this uh, cyclic group. So we can take, for example, G, and we can um, multiply it by G cubed, and we'll get G uh, to the fourth, right? Uh, and so because of that, we can do exponentiation. We can sort of take any of these group elements and, and exponentiate them by, uh, by uh, you know, some number. And um, in this case, the group is size Q. Right. I think it's, yeah, it's size Q. Q minus 1. Um, yeah. OK. And so uh, what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to have the client and the server each uh, pick a group element randomly. And uh, we'll call the, cl the client's A and the server's B. Now we want the client to send G to the A over to the server, and the server is going to send G to the B over to the client. Uh, and one thing that's interesting is that the G to the A and G to the B are within the group G. So um, any of these group operations, the result of that is, uh, is actually going to still be in the group when you're done. Um, anyway, so the point is that, uh, that now the client and the server have, have these values. And then um, we're, we're, we're trying to produce sort of a shared key in the end here that both the client and the server possess. But, but yet somebody who's sitting here in the middle watching these messages go by, um, uh, they can't do anything with the messages that they see to get this value here. And so how is the client and the server going to agree on this value somehow? Well, if they each take the, the thing that they received from the other party and uh, take it to the power of the um, group element that they selected randomly at the beginning, then they'll, they'll derive this dh key value, and they'll both end up being the same value. In particular, if you uh, run this through here, you'll see that basically, so the client received b from the server, right? Uh, it, it takes that to the power a, and it gets uh, b to the a gets, gives it this, and that's uh, the same as what the, the server does. It's just, uh, you know, because this is whatever the term is, commutative, I think. So we end up with the same value here, dh key, on both sides. 
yeah, so this is nice uh, because now we have a key that we can use. We can use this with an encryption algorithm to encrypt all the future messages between the, s the server and the client. Does that make sense? Cool, so this is called Diffie-Hellman. Um, and yeah, the important part is that both the, the client and the, the both the parties need to, need to agree on the same key. Uh, and, and, and you'll, you'll notice that, that somebody, some, somebody in the middle here is who, sort of an attacker who's observing uh, that the messages go by here. They only get G to the A, G to the B. Of course, they also have G because G is, also, G is publicly known, like I mentioned before. And using G, G to the A, and G to the B, there's no way to get uh, G to the AB. Right? Because, okay, so I see a few space. What is G to the A times G to the B? I mean, if you have That's not, that, what is that? Oh, I forgot to mention. Yeah, so w that's one of the properties that the cyclic group gives us. So uh, the, the way the group is selected, it's, we, we, it's computationally difficult to do that. Yeah, so just assume that you can't do that. Yeah, you have to look more into the, the way the cyclic group stuff works to, to understand why that is, but take 255 for that, yeah. Um, it's a good point. Yeah, you can't sort of call log on that. It's, it's a huge number, and it's, it's, just, it's computationally infeasible. Yeah, really good question, yeah. All right, so that's Sophie Hellman. Okay, so, but of course we see here the problem, w one problem we have here is the, the client has, has, has now, um, you know, is, is pleased because it knows that it has this DH key that the server also derived, and so, you know, they can now use the, this shared key to, to communicate securely, right? But it doesn't know who the server is. It could be anybody. This could, this could be the, the network attacker uh, that it's actually negotiated this secure key with, uh, this shared key with, right? So that's, 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 uh, that's a problem. Does everybody see that? Okay, cool. So. So yeah, this is called anonymous key exchange. And the, the problem is we don't know which server we actually performed this key exchange with. It's possible that it could, could have been the, the network attacker. And so while the communication is technically private, um, it's private to a party who we don't know, you know, we don't know who that party is. And so we say that this lacks authentication. And without authentication, you can't actually have the privacy property that we want. Cool, so we'll show, just to make that clear, here's a uh, a sort of example of a man in the middle attack on anonymous defeat Hellman key exchange. And so uh, we have the same group as before, but now we'll insert an attacker here. And so now when the client uh, derives its A uh, uh, and the server derives its B, the attacker is also going to derive a value here, uh, C. And now the, the client sort of goes through the same process as before. And remember, it doesn't know this attacker's here. This is some party. This is the router. This is the ISP. This is some, this is some party that's between the client and the server. And this party is sort of secretly modifying uh, the messages. Here. So this is an active attacker, to be clear. This is an attacker that's willing to mess with the messages in order to, to trick the client. And so what it's going to do here is it's going to, uh, when it sees this message come through, it doesn't forward it along to the real server. Instead, it sends back G to the C, where C is its own, uh, its own uh, secret that it, it selected. And, uh, and so now there's this, we're going to call it DH key one, which is a, a key that's going to be agreed upon by both the, this client and this attacker. And so the client has no way to know this happened. And then, of course, um, at this point, the client is going to make some kind of a request to what it thinks is the server here. Uh, and at that point, uh, we will, oh yeah, I guess that's just showing that, yeah. So at this point, the attacker will want to itself negotiate a connection to the real server here. And from this server's perspective, this is just some client that's shown up who wants to send a request to the server. And so we'll run through the same sort of algorithm over here where the attacker sends C, uh, sorry, the attacker sends G to the C to the server, the server sends G to the B to the attacker, and they negotiate a shared uh, key, DH key 2, uh, which, uh, which is uh, G to the BC. Uh, and so that, you know, that's shared here, and those two are shared there. And so now, at this point, any, you know, sort of this request from the client can get forwarded along uh, this connection here, and then the response can get sent back to them, and they won't know that they're, that they're being man-in-the-middle. So it's called a man-in-the-middle attack. Any questions about this? Does the, does the cyclic group stuff make sense to everybody, or like sort of at least at the level I've explained it at? Okay. Yeah. How does exponentiating a large number to a larger, like a really large number, not take like forever to compute? So there's, uh, there's some optimizations that they, that they have to make that fast. I'm not too familiar with the details of it. Gotcha. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like there are tricks to make it relatively fast. Yeah, okay. Cool. So how are we going to add authentication to this? 
So uh, our goal now is we want the um, client to, if the, if the client could somehow figure out who it was talking to, then it could securely derive a shared key with, with that and only that server. That's our goal. Uh, and so uh, I mentioned before signing in, in lecture three when we were talking about cookies and introduced sort of the, the way that signing works. And uh, that's what we're going to use here. So uh, the, the whole sort of idea there is, is called public key cryptography. And uh, if we use that, we can sort of add that on to this Diffie-Hellman key exchange and get what we want, um, which is authentication. And so let's just quickly review the signature schemes, uh, that, uh, the way that signature schemes work uh, from before. So we have uh, a triple of algorithms here, uh, G, S, and V. So G is the generator. And so we, uh, we, when we call the generator, we get out a public key and a secret key. And so these are going to be uh, uh, randomly picked, but the, the public key and the secret key are, are tied together in, in, a, uh, in a way. And then the signing algorithm takes in the secret key and some input x that we want to sign, and then it outputs t, which is, which is what we call the tag. And then we have a verification algorithm, which can take in the public key, an input x, the same input x, and a, and a tag. And then in that situation, it would accept saying that this is actually a, a tag that uh, was generated by uh, you know, uh, an s function with this input. So it's used to check the validity of a, of a tag a, a t, for a t on an input x. Right, okay, so the way, maybe one way to think about this that would be useful is uh, um, we have uh, some, you know, one way you can use this is you have some party who wants to uh, announce something to the world and they want the whole world to know that it's them who said it. And so uh, if that party called G generated a, p a public key and a secret key, kept the secret key secret, and published the public key far and wide, um, so everyone knows this person's public key now, and now this person wants to sort of say something and have everybody know um, that they, they're the one who said it, they could uh, take the message X that they want to say, run it through S with their secret key that only they have, produce a tag T, and now they can take T along with X uh, and uh, post it sort of somewhere on a bulletin board, and anyone who comes along now can confirm that, that, was, the, that, that it was said by that person. So they take the, they take the X and they, they take the T that was posted there, they put it into V to verify that it was actually said by that person. In order to do that, they also need to have the public key, which was originally published sort of far and wide. Everyone knows it. Uh, and then uh, and that, would, that would return accept if that was actually a message X that was uh, signed by uh, the owner of the secret key. OK, cool. So of course, the properties we need here are, for correctness, we have to ensure that anytime you do this, anytime you do actually take the output of S uh, and then put it in here as the tag, that you're going to get an accept every time, uh, or else it's, this, isn't gonna, this is not correct. Uh, and then we also need. Um, uh, to ensure that this only ha that this only happens when it's a, a t that's actually pr produced from one of these s functions validly. So if an attacker c gives you a random t, uh, a random tag that they made up, it shouldn't verify. This should this should never return accept, uh, or if it does, should be very very rarely. Cool. Does that all make sense? Cool. So that's just a review of signature schemes. Cool. So so now um, if we if we, th if we th use signature schemes. In our Diffie-Hellman key exchange, we get authenticated Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So let's see how to do this. So we're going to do the same thing as before. Um, we have the group G, um, but this time the uh, server generated, so the server called G and generated a, a public key and a secret key. Um, and it kept its secret key secret, and uh, it announced its public key far and wide. And so somehow the client sort of already knows the public key. Um, and we'll get to how, how, how we actually accomplish that in the real world later. But um, but we'll just assume for now the client knows PK in advance, and the server obviously has the has its secret key, and uh, and so now we do the same thing as before. So we do um, the client and the server generate A and B. Uh, the client sends G to the A to the server, uh, but now before the server sends a response, it's going to take uh, the, a transcript of everything that's happened in this exchange so far, uh, which in this case is just the fact that the client sent G to the A to the server. Um, and it's going to sign that transcript with its secret key and produce a tag T. And so now it can send its G to the B to the client along with the tag T. And before the client actually goes ahead and does the, um, derives the shared key that it's going to use with the server, it first verifies that the tag T is actually valid. 
So it's going to call uh, the verification function on the PK with the transcript and the tag T that it received from the server. And so only the, 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 the owner of the secret key should be able to actually produce a tag T here, where this will actually return accept, right? So if we're talking to anyone else, if we're talking to a man in the middle, then um, the tag is not going to be valid. So this is going to, let's say it returns uh, uh, accept, then we're, we're, we're good. And so we can go ahead and uh, now, now actually derive the, uh, the DH key um, on, 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 on the client. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, it's going to match with the server just like before. Yeah? Um, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. So the server signed G to the B. What would happen? And I guess also, is G to the B included in the transcript? I would actually think it, I think it would be included because. Because uh, like otherwise, you could just send some random thing and then send the actual transcript. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to exclude G to the B because otherwise you could send literally anything, like whatever you as a cl as an attacker client, you could just send any message to the server and it'll sign that message for you, um, which, which means um, uh, you, could, you could then use that to man in the middle, uh, uh, you know, other connections by just sort of taking whatever the client sends, getting the server to sign a thing, and then, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. that's why I was asking, like, whether the, trans like the rest of the transcript even matters when it's all, like, kind of contingent on Contingent on G to the B. Yeah, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, let's see, I mean... I can't think of what would break if we removed G to the A from the transcript right now, but it, it, there might be something. Um, I have to think about it a little bit more. Yeah, do you have an idea? I think it has something to do with like if there was a previous session, like if you didn't sign the entire transcript and you only signed that one message, mm -hmm. then like you could send a message, and then as an attacker, you just save that message and then send it in a different session. Mm. Does that make sense? But it would have to be. It wouldn't have to be the same session. It would have to be a session that also used the same G to the B, right? It, seem, it seems like uh, you're onto something there, but I feel like, yeah, do you have, do you have some thoughts? I guess, would it only be that you could use it for any session that had the same G? Because the client doesn't know which G the server has chosen. So as long as the G is the same, then you would, then the, that would, the B code is G to the B sign message. Mm -hmm. And just pretend that's what the server had chosen. So uh, I think that, um, that, so if we're assuming here that this transcript actually includes the G to the B that the server is about to send, so it's including G to the A and G to the B in the transcript, then... Um, but as in, like, the attacker just drops the server's response entirely and sends the G to the B. Oh, I see what you're saying. And sends it with uh, its own... Because of the key sign that the... Mm. Yeah, that seems possible, yeah. Yeah. In general, when you mess with any of these protocols, you just break it in some some way that's like maybe not obvious to you in the moment, but then turns out to be really important later. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think we should move on though. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, um, there's th the main problem that we've solved here is we, we've, uh, we've ensured that the client can validate that it's talking to the owner of the secret key in this case, uh, the, key, the secret key that goes with the public key that it knows about. Um, and you'll notice one thing is it's actually not, um, it's not like a two-way authentication. The server actually, at this point, has no idea who it's talking to, um, and, and it's kind of okay with that. This, this, it doesn't, it's not a big deal if the server doesn't know who it's talking to in this case, because uh, once we have this, uh, this shared key, it's, um, the client is about to send an HTTP request, which is probably, let's say it's going to contain a username and a password to log into the site here. So as soon as the client is sure that it's talking to this server, the client is happy to send a username and password across that connection because it knows it's going to the site that it wants it to go to, right? Um, and so, um, and then at that point, the server can 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 confirm the username and the password, and that's going to all happen at the web application layer. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, uh, so, how does the client actually get this server's public key? You you, you could imagine that we, um, we just take the, take the website's public key and build it into the browser. Um, and we have to go sort of go to all the different websites and say, uh, uh, give us your public key and we'll include it in our browser so that when somebody visits the site, they'll know your public key. 
but that would be a huge list and it would be constantly changing. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and if the list was even slightly out of date, you wouldn't be able to actually uh, negotiate a secure connection with the server. And so that's obviously not a good approach. Um, another idea would be maybe the server could send the public key to the client that it's about to uh, connect. Uh, the, it could send the key to the client during this key exchange process. And then um, now, uh, you know, now that the client sort of has the public key that it needs to do, to do this whole thing. Um, and um, what's the problem with that? Does anyone? Why wouldn't that work? Yeah. You haven't authenticated the server yet, so you don't know if it's really the server giving you the public key. Yeah, exactly. So, so we're back to the same problem as before. If, if we let the server send us the PK that it wants us to use for this whole um, Diffie-Hellman exchange, then um, we have no way to know that we're actually talking to the correct server because the attacker could send their own uh, public key in the exchange. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, so we, can't, we can't do that. So that, 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 would, that would take us back to anonymous key exchange. Um, and so we need something better than this. So, uh, yeah, okay so, okay. so the solution is certificate authorities. Um, who here knows about certificate authorities or has heard this term before? Oh, wow, okay. Preachers in the choir. Everybody knows. Um, so a certificate authority is going to be... Um, the one who issues digital certificates to uh, the site owner. And in particular, it's going to certify that a specifically named subject is the owner of, of a specific public key. And so it's, you can think of it kind of like the certificate authority is making the, the following statement. It's saying, I, this certificate authority, certify that this subject name is the owner of this public key. And uh, this statement is, uh, is, is useful because if we just trust a sort of, if we just trust a small handful of certificate authorities, uh, and this statement comes from one of the ones that we trust, uh, then it, it, it's a very useful way for us to now learn that this subject name is the owner of this public key. And so we can then take it on faith when a server uh, sends us its public key that it is actually the correct public key. So a server will say, "This is my public key," and also, by the way, this person that you trust, the certificate authority. Will, will vouch for the fact that this is indeed my public key. And when the client gets these two things together, it now is willing to sort of uh, trust that this is the public key that it should use. And so you can look at any, um, any of the certificates that your browser uh, gets sent by servers by just sort of clicking on the lock and then uh, clicking on the more information button. And then you get this, this whole sort of uh, spiel about the details of the certificate. And um, there's a few fields that are interesting in here. So one is um, there's like a bunch of, of sort of like uh, information about the sort of entity that owns this, uh, that's, that's been issued the certificate. In this case, uh, Google LLC has been issued it. Um, but the, the, the part that the browser actually cares about is not, has nothing to do with uh, the country, the state. Like that, that actually isn't used in any way. The most important field that the browser cares about is the common name field. And so this is the field where it's actually going to look at it and compare it to the URL that you're on. And it's going to say, is this actually a certificate for the site that the user is visiting? Um, and if it is, that, that, that's great. That means that you know, we should actually care about this certificate. Um, if it's some other certificate for some other random site, then of course this, this is not useful. Um, yeah, and then uh, you can see who actually issued the certificate here. So in this case, it's Google Trust Services, which is the CA. So Google issued itself a certificate. Uh, and we also... Uh, we also see, I guess, yeah, this is interesting. So this is actually the public key that's uh, being signed uh, or that's being sort of validated in this, in this certificate. And then here's the actual um, um, like signature from the, from the CA. And so when the client gets this, it can sort of, it can look up, does it trust this CA? And if it does trust this CA, then great, it's going to now trust that uh, this public key is the public key that belongs to mail.google.com. Cool. So then, um, just a few details about the common name. So that's the, that's the mail.google.com field here. So uh, it's usually an explicit name, but it can also be a wild card. Um, if it's a wild card, then you just put a star in there, and then anything that matches that will, um, will uh, the browser will then trust that this is a certificate for that, uh, for that uh, sort of whole set of dom domains. So this is really useful if you're, if you have a site like, uh, like, uh, Tumblr or GitHub or something where you have like millions of users creating uh, sites and you're 
you're letting them select the, the subdomain for the site. So it's like something.tumblr.com or something.github.io or whatever, um, because you don't want to be generating like tons of, you know, millions of certificates in that situation. So you want to gener generate one and say, this is trusted for this whole set, sort of subdomains. Um, and then to, to actually uh, match, the rules here uh, is that the star matches the leftmost subdomain component, um, and it doesn't match dots. And so that just means that basically the star does what you think it does. So it's like anything.stanford.edu, uh, but not, uh, you know, so star.a.com would match x.a.com, uh, but it wouldn't match y.x.a.com. So you can't sort of have an infinite number of subdomains tacked on there. Mm -hmm. Just curious, in the previous slide, uh, the signature at the bottom, is that the CA signature on the public key, or like the public key signature on the message that's returning requests? I thought it was the CA's public key. But it's under, it's under the public key info, which is making me think that you might be right. It might be something to do with the actual public key itself, yeah. Um, but yeah, you might be right there, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool, so, uh, so that's the common name. Um, and uh, I guess the other thing to mention is there's, there's also this other thing, I don't know if it's in this uh, screenshot here, called the alternate subject name. An alternate subject name is just uh, a way to include more than one domain in here without using a star. Um, so you could, instead of, of saying like star.google.com, you could say like this certificate is from mail.google.com, but also gmail.com, and also, you know, um, I don't know, googlemail.com. In case there's a sort of variant names, you could just sort of throw those in there as alternate subject names, and the browser will, will sort of uh, compare against all that, that, that full list. So you might see that if, you're, if, you're, if you look at some certificates in the wild. Okay, so how do we figure out um, uh, what uh, CAs our browser actually uh, actually trusts? So there's um, there's a list that you can look up. Um, in the case of uh, Firefox, it's built into the browser itself, and so you can actually just go right into Firefox settings and say, "Show me all the CAs that my browser is trusting right now." Um, and it's very interesting. It's, I recommend just going and looking through it. It's really fascinating. Um, in this case, here's the Google Trust Services LLC, the one that we saw in the Google certificate. Um, but any of these other CAs here actually has the power to issue certificates that your browser is going to trust. Um, and there's, some, there's just really interesting ones in here, like one I just saw right before class is uh, Hong Kong Post is the post office in Hong Kong, can issue certificates for any site. Um, and there's a few other interesting ones in there. Um, there's a whole bunch of governments. Um, there's a ton of different companies. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, actually, so, one thing that is interesting is sometimes one organization actually has uh, multiple uh, 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 secret keys that are trusted by the, by the browser. And so actually, if we go and uh, have that same page right here pulled up, um, you can actually sort of expand uh, any of these organizations here. And you can see there's actually a whole bunch of different root certificates that are trusted. So Google actually has four here. Um, and um, sometimes if it's not clear, like, what the organization does, you can sort of expand and sort of try to figure out based on the certificate name what, what, what they might be associated with. Um, there was one that was really interesting that I saw before. Um, where is it? This one, Government Root Certification Authority. It's like not clear what, uh, what government that is, but if you open it up, you can see uh, who, who it's for. Um, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of these. It's about like uh, on the order of like 50 or 60 in here. Um, for other browsers that are non-Firefox, um, in particular like Chrome and Safari, they use a certificate store which is built into the operating system. And so when you get your computer like directly from the factory, it has a hard-coded list of different CAs that it's going to trust. And so Chrome and Safari and I think most of the other browsers that are Chromium-based are just going to look at that uh, certificate store that's in your operating system. And then uh, whatever's, whatever's in there, it's going to just trust. Um, I don't know why Firefox ships their own with the browser. Um, if anyone knows that, that would actually be really interesting. Uh, but, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, what else do we want to say about CAs? Any questions about CAs? Yeah. So can you manually go in and, like, distrust certain CAs and just delete certain ones if you don't want to trust, like, maybe the Hong Kong post office? <laughs> yeah, you totally can. Um, it just means that any site that got their certificate from, uh, from that CA is going to now cause, like, warnings in your browser when you go to those sites. Um, so. It would be interesting to like look up what sites you're going to break when you delete those CAs to sort of do like a, a risk reward analysis before doing that. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it also possible to add scene in general? Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. Like, so then can an attacker add their, like, own CA and issue a filter to your, a specific CA? So that's a, that's a great question. So a attacker, an attacker is not going to be able to uh, get their own certificate trusted by, like, all the Chrome browsers, right? But if the attacker already has malware on your computer, like one of the things the malware could do is go in and add the, their own uh, key as a trusted key in your CA store. And uh, if they do that, then yes, then now they are able to man in the middle all your traffic because what would they do? They would take, uh, they would take their uh, secret key, they would issue a certificate for the site they want to man in the middle and, and say they want to man in the middle Gmail, right? And now uh, when, they, uh, when they intercept your request to, to Gmail, they're going to send back like their fake page with their uh, fake certificate attached that your browser is going to trust. Yeah, so it's really it's a it's a huge. I mean, if you if, if an attacker gets gets a, an additional entry in, in this uh, store here, then like your your um, they can manage anything basically. In fact, actually, that's one of the things that employers do. Um, if you ever get like a, a, a not, I don't know if all employers do, but a lot of employers will when they issue you a laptop uh, will actually add. Uh, a new like trusted uh, CA into into the store that, in the laptop that they give you, and that's so that they can while you're in the while you're sort of uh, on the company network, they can man in the middle all your traffic. Uh, and there's actually sort of network appliances like boxes that these companies will just buy that will just actively man in the middle all the traffic on the network um, for security reasons. <laughs> They'll often want to sort of inspect the traffic and look for different things like, are you talking to a known malware domain? You know, maybe. Maybe they're worried that, like, you know, if 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 all the traffic going by is in completely encrypted, there's no way for them to know what their employees are doing, right? Um, maybe 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 there's some malware that's sort of exfiltrating a bunch of data, right? Um, so uh, one of the arguments is they want to be able to inspect all these requests and sort of make security decisions. Um, maybe they also want to be able to tell if uh, some employee is is uploading a bunch of uh, a bunch of company data to a server somewhere, right? So this, this kind of thing, maybe putting something in Dropbox that they shouldn't, right? Um, uh, yeah. So, but but it's it's kind of uh, it's it's kind of dubious because they're sort of improving security by like breaking TLS uh, kind of completely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions about about uh, TLS stuff? Yeah, it's really fascinating. Like the politics behind like sort of who gets included in this list too. Um, and, and like what happens when an organization sort of sh proves that it shouldn't be trusted anymore with, with the ability to issue these certificates. Um, cool, so let's actually just like look at what happens with the protocol when we actually do a certificate exchange. Okay, so um, now in this example, we're just gonna include the certificate authority as an organization here. Um, and so the first thing we have to do is the server needs a certificate. So the server's gonna go out and ask for a certificate. Oh, okay, I guess for, first, oh, sorry, first, first step is that uh, like I said before, the, the, the browser is going to inc already include the public key of, of, of all the CAs that it trusts. So in this example, the, um, this CA here is already trusted by our, our browser over there. Okay, and so now um, this server generates a public key and a secret key for itself, for the server, that it's going to use to securely communicate with all the clients that show up later. Uh, but the problem it has is its public key is not trusted by the client. Uh, and so um, when the client gets this, P this PK from the server later, it's, it's not going to know that this is a PK for example.com. So that's the problem we're going to solve here with this cer certificate authority. Right? So what do we do? We send our PK to the certificate authority and also give them some kind of proof that we are example.com. This proof could be, um, you know, like mailing them like your, your driver's license saying like, you know, I'm this person and I own example.com. Uh, in practice, it typically just is uh, some kind of proof that uh, you that this person who's sending this request is is in control of example.com. So typically, what the CA will do is it will it will just tell tell this person, hey, to prove that you own example.com, just take this file and put it on the site at this URL. So I can go visit this URL and I can confirm you added the file that I asked you to, I asked you to add, and only therefore you you must have access to this domain. You must be authorized to do this. Something like that. There's, all, there's various ways to prove it. It could also be like they ask you to sort of modify the DNS in some way. Um, or uh, another way is there's literally like a sort of, a, uh, sort of interactive protocol they can ask you to run with them uh, where they'll talk to example.com, they'll make a connection to example.com, and then you have to answer with a certain answer. Uh, but the point is you sort of have to satisfy the CA that you are actually the owner of example.com. Once you've done that, 
uh, well, yeah, they'll confirm that, that, that the proof is actually uh, satisfactory to them. And then they will uh, go ahead and sign the message, the message from before, where they say, I, the CA, uh, attest that example.com uh, has a public key of PK. And they're going to go ahead and sign that with their secret key. Uh, and then they produce this, uh, this uh, certificate. They go ahead and send the certificate to the server. And, and now uh, the server has the certificate that it can give to all the clients that show up in the future. And so this process only happens one time. Um, it's not going to be repeated. It's you know, only going to be repeated when the certificate expires, which might happen you know, every year or something like that. Um, yeah. So now when a client uh, shows up, uh, I'm omitting some steps here. Like th this, is, uh, this is where the Diffie-Hellman exchange is going to happen. But at some point in the Diffie-Hellman exchange, the server is going to send the certificate to the client. And the client's going to validate it using the public key of the CA that it has. And it's going to say, is this actually a certificate that came from the CA that I trust? Um, and if the answer is yes, uh, then it's going to say, all right, also, is this actually a certificate for the domain that I was trying to talk to? I don't care if it's a certificate for a different domain. It has to be the one that I was trying to talk to. If it is, then uh, now, we're, now, we're, now we're sort of confident that uh, that this is actually the, the, the PK that we should use, um, uh, uh, that, we, that we, should, uh, we should trust. Uh, and so now we can actually sort of, sort of, um, uh, sort of trust the messages in the Diffie-Hellman exchange that follows. Yeah? Sorry, a side question, but I was just wondering, can an attacker disrupt the connection between the server and the certificate of origin? Like if they just wanted to hijack or disable the server? Oh, yeah. So this happens one time. So, uh, so you're saying like, could could they could they disrupt the process somehow? Yeah, like for example, you said hmm. the certificate authority gives them like a file to insert in a web page. Can yeah. Not an attacker maybe like intercept that and put it into and sort of just to prevent the server from ever getting that certificate. Mm. To sure. Yeah, that's totally possible. Um, that's I would say that's sort of outside of this the scope of like the the TLS protocol itself. Um, but but yeah, I mean, if if the, if the server can't even get the certificate to sort of send to all of its users, then it's kind of in, yeah, it's kind of in trouble because it can't prove anything now to its clients. So it does need a way to get this. In fact, actually, your question it makes a lot of sense um, with uh, the way that people often will implement this process nowadays uh, because there's this new certificate authority called Let's Encrypt that pretty much everyone is is using now. It's it's uh, sort of the fastest growing CA uh, by by a, by a huge margin, and that's because the certificates that it issues are free. Um, previously, usually these, these CAs would charge about $100 or so to, to do this for you. Uh, and so Let's Encrypt is a nonprofit. I think it's funded by Mozilla and, and a few other nonprofits. And, uh, and so they're, they're just giving certificates away for free to anyone who can prove that they own, that they own the domain. Um, and so uh, one of the things they did as part of that is they just provide like a command line tool that you can call. And then it, it, uh, it talks to the Let's Encrypt, Encrypt servers and then provides you back a certificate. And, um, uh, because they have this tool, they're actually trying to make this process a lot more foolproof. So typically, you would like you would do this would be some kind of thing involving emailing like some random you know this random company, and maybe a human would be reviewing it, and there's sort of a lot of uh, room for error. But now with Let's Encrypt, you just uh, you just call this uh, you, you run this command line program, it calls an API, and then you just get back the certificate in like three seconds. And so for that reason, these certificates actually tend to expire a lot uh, quicker now because. They figure, well, since you're automating things, you're, you're, you're calling this program, why don't we make these certificates expire in like three months? That way, if, uh, why, why would we want to do that? Well, well why, why do you get additional security from, from a short expiration? Any ideas? Yeah? Because somebody gets their secret key? Yeah, if they get your secret key, now the damage is limited to three months instead of a year, right? It's still really bad, but, but yeah, so we, we want, this, the, we want the, the sort of uh, expiration date to be, to be sort of relatively soon. Uh, and so for that reason, that means that, that, yeah, if this process gets disrupted in any way, and typically it's an automated like cron job or something that's just running like once every, uh, every week to check if the certificate needs to be renewed. If you do disrupt that process in some way, then you can take the site offline if that, if that doesn't run when people are expecting it to run. Yeah, that is actually interesting. Uh, but that's, that's, again, that's like a denial of service. That's not really going to be uh, uh, not going to let somebody be a man in the middle, for example. Cool. So let's keep going. So, um, Oh, yeah, and so yeah, just to be very clear here, this certificate is reused for all the client connections that happen. So we're not like we're not going back to the CA to get a new certificate every time. Like that's just a one-time thing, um, or a once every three months thing. <clears throat> cool. All right, so um, TLS 1.3. This is the latest version of TLS. It replaces a whole bunch of previous versions. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the like exact details of it because I'm not an expert on that. Um, 
But if you want to know all about that, I really recommend taking 255. It's a really, really great class. Um, but uh, it is interesting that all these previous versions had like catastrophic problems in them uh, and had to be replaced. Uh, <laughs> and we've been through so many versions. And if you, if you ever heard the term SSL, it's often used interchangeably with TLS. And that's just sort of a previous, really, really old version of, uh, of, 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 of TLS. And uh, like as of today, I believe no browser actually will uh, talk to a server that is using any of the SSL versions or even TLS 1.0. Um, and they're just so broken that the browsers have decided, like, if a site tries to talk to us uh, using TLS 1.0, 1, 1 uh, like, we're just going to throw up an error page and, and say that the, the server's broken. You can't talk to the site. 1.1 um, and 1.2 are headed that way. So uh, I believe, uh, is it 1.2 or is it? One of those is, is also about to be, is out, is about to, uh, to be listed as um, uh, untrusted by browsers in 2020. Um, and so, yeah, this sort of march of progress goes on. Um, and uh, and uh, TLS 1.3 seems to have no problems as far as, as we know right now. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so it, has, it, has, it, has, um, it has two phases. I kind of alluded to both of them. The first, point, the first step is sort of establishing this shared secret. So that's, that's the part we've been going into a lot of detail about. Um, and once we have this shared secret using the, the certificate, um, we then use that to actually just uh, en encrypt all the data that we, that we send and receive. Uh, and that, that's the second part of, 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 of TLS 1.3. Um, that part is uh, like relatively more straightforward. Um, it's just sort of you take this key and you, and you, you put it through an, an encryption algorithm. Um, OK, so, so that's, that's, that's how TLS works. But then if we add HTTP on top, that, we, that, that gives us, uh, that gives us the, the lock in the browser. It gives us HTTPS. And so one thing we're, th we're thinking about is how does the browser actually decide when it should show the lock and when it should not show the lock? So um, the rules are like, um, they involve like checking more than just sort of the, the initial HTML page you got back. And that's because the page can contain references to scripts and images and all kinds of resources from other sites. And so we don't want to show the user a lock unless every element on the page was fetched with HTTPS. Because if you if you fetch the home page with you know if you fetch the main page with, with HTTPS but you fetch some script with uh, HTTP then what could happen? Man in the middle, yeah. Yeah, the man in the middle attacker can modify the HTTP response for the script and now they're running a script on your page. So it doesn't matter that you that your main page is HTTPS you're completely owned. So we don't show the lock unless everything on the page is fetched using HTTPS. Um, and so yeah, and for, that means for each element. For every single um, different site that we connected to, in order to get all those different elements, every script, every image, we're going to perform all these checks. So we're going to make sure the certificate that came back was issued by a CA that we actually trust, not any old CA. And we're going to make sure that the certificate is not expired and that the, um, the common name or the subject alternate name matches the URL uh, of, the, of the, um, the origin. So if that's all true and, every, and it's true for all elements, then we show the lock to the user. And so the user is supposed to feel like, ah, oh, I see a lock. Like I feel all good about uh, connecting to this site. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's stopping a phishing page like g0google.com from applying for a cert to let's encrypt and getting one and appearing like more legit because they have a lock icon? Yeah, I mean uh, nothing. That's one of the that's actually one of the biggest criticisms of let's encrypt is that. Uh, all they care about is that you own the domain that you're trying to get a certificate for, and if you can prove that you own it, then they'll give you a certificate. They don't care at all if it's like a, a clearly a, a site that's going to be used for phishing or is too, really similar to another site. So in theory, in theory, the CAs were actually checking this before, uh, but I say in theory because like a lot of times these companies were just uh, trying to do as little work as possible, and just even though they were collecting $100, and you might think like, ah, oh, they could actually afford to like look at the thing before they issue you the certificate, oftentimes like that didn't actually, that little extra step didn't actually add us any protection. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, the consensus is that it's just better to give everybody certificates and deal with that problem that you mentioned another way. Uh, and so maybe Google Safe Browsing is a way to solve that where we just sort of uh, mark those known phishing sites as phishing sites and the browser will throw up a warning. Oh, there's, there's also an experiment that Chrome, uh, I think, is running now, which is quite interesting. It actually does some, some machine learning on the, uh, I, it, uses, it uses some ML thing they developed to look at the URL and then uh, 
see if it contains like typos to, to any of the sites that are like really popular. And so they have some list of like top sites. And if you're visiting a site that's like one letter off, uh, they have some way of throwing up a warning saying like, did you mean to go to this other site? Um, there's, there's all kinds of different approaches you can use. That one's kind of interesting. Okay, so this is a slide from Dan Bonet's lecture from 255, um, where he talks about actually sort of the details of how TLS 1.3 actually works. Um, we, we sort of, I already showed sort of uh, the high level here, but um, when you actually go to implement TLS 1.3, you know, the messages have specific names, like you have client hello, you have server hello. Um, this is the, the key share part here. This is uh, the, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange that we already talked about. So this is like the client sending its G to the A to the server, and this is the server sending its G to the B back to the client. Um, uh, but you also include a nonce. Why do we include a nonce? Does anyone know? Yeah? <laughs> so explain. Uh, well, because you're sending a transcript, I guess, of mm -hmm. the message. So you want some randomness in there so that you can't reuse the transcript. Yeah, so specifically, if um, we didn't include this, then uh, a man in the middle, a person who, or, 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 an attacker who observes this uh, message to the server could uh, replay it. And um, in this case, uh, nothing doesn't seem like anything bad would happen. But what I think where this actually st starts to matter is um, uh, in order to make this whole process go faster, um, there's this thing that uh, that, that uh, browsers and servers like to do called zero round trip time or zero RTT. And the idea is if you look at all this, look at how many back and forths there are, right? Um, it's not until down here where we actually send the HTTP request to the server. And, and so if you're really worried about performance, you might want to sort of try to get the HTTP request to the server sooner so it can start to work on the request and start to get the response ready uh, even before this whole uh, process has happened. And so um, there's a way, I'm not going to go into how, but you, you basically send, the, you send that uh, request up here with the hello. Uh, and if that's included with the hello and there's no nonce, um, then you can, uh, an attacker could see that message go by and then later on, so take a copy of it and then send it to the server. And then the server will go ahead and, 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 and sort of uh, act as if it received that request again and run it, run it again, right? And so if that request was, you know, buy something on Amazon, uh, then, th then it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause the server to do that action twice, right? Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the, that, that attack there. Um, but yeah, anyway, so, th so that's, uh, that's what the nonce is for. And then you'll see the server sends the certificate that it got from the CA back. That's just like what we talked about. Um, it's encrypting it first, uh, and that's just so that if somebody's watching this whole transaction uh, or this whole, um, this whole protocol, uh, they, they won't know... Uh, what server you're talking to by looking at the certificate. Uh, and so they're, um, the server's go hang, go, going ahead and encrypting this certificate with the, um, shared, the, shared, uh, the shared secret that you're going to use for all the future sort of messages down here. Um, and so, so, so now a, a passive observer can't see what the certificate is. Does that make sense? OK. Um, what else? We're also, we're also uh, signing the data. Data here is just the transcript of everything that's happened so far. So it's just like what I, I mentioned before. Um, and why do we do that? That's, that's because, of course, we don't, want, um, uh, we don't want this whole thing to be um, uh, a man in the middle. And, and then finally, we, we, just, we, just, we send finished. And then we, we, we run this key derivation function to get some session keys. And then we use this is actually the, the thing we're going to use for, uh, for encrypting our, our HTTP requests. Um, I think that's most of the important stuff. Um, yeah, any, any questions? Yeah? Uh, in order to decrypt the uh, encryption for the certificate, don't you need the public key, which the certificate is telling, you need, which you need the certificate for to tell you to trust the public key? Um, so I think what's going on is um, the, the key share here and this key share, like once this message gets to the client, it uses the information in this message along with the, the A, you know, the, the secret that it generated before to produce that shared Diffie-Hellman key that they're going to use. And so just by using this, it can get that key, and then it can decrypt this message and then pull out the certificate. And then it can look at the certificate and decide if it wants to trust it, if it was signed by one of the CAs that it trusts. Yeah, so it, it's, it's totally willing to sort of decrypt this on a kind of provisional basis, like just, just to get the certificate out before it actually sort of trusts, uh, you know, uh, trusts sort of the rest of the, the stuff in the protocol. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Okay, so let's keep going. 
Okay, so yeah, so basically we mentioned nonces that prevents replays of old sessions, um, but we also have uh, another really nice property in, in TLS 1.3 called, uh, called forward secrecy. And um, this is really cool. So this, this is, um, the, 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 the thing we're worried about here is what happens if the server gets hacked and some attacker goes ahead and steals this secret key here? Um, uh, now, obviously, they can man in the middle, uh, or they can, um, you know, they can be a man in the middle now. But, but on top of that, one really, really bad thing they can also do is if they were in this network position here and observing all this, uh, all this traffic and they were saving it, um, just saving it in case they might one day be able to get their hands on the secret key, then uh, we're really in big trouble now. Because, you know, for, let's say for like a year they were just sitting here and saving all this traffic. It's meaningless traffic. They don't know what to do with it because, of course, you know, this, that's the whole point of TLS is that the, the man in the middle can't do anything. A passive observer can't do anything with what they're observing. But if they get their hands on the secret key and then they can suddenly decrypt all of that traffic from the last year, that's really, really bad. So we want to ideally not have that be a problem. We want it to be the case that if you get the secret key, all you can do is, is man in the middle traffic in the future. And so that's actually what this accomplishes here. Um, so you'll notice that the only thing the secret key is used for here is to sign the transcript. It's not used to generate, it has nothing to do with the key that we actually use for the um, secure communication. So we generate this shared key, and then, uh, and then once this, this whole um, exchange is finished, and we send out, like the server sends its response to the client, then we throw away the key material. We throw away the A, we throw away the, the G to the A to the B that we uh, uh, that we generated, and and uh, and so and so. Even if somebody gets the secret key, that's not enough for them to decrypt all of this traffic. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's really important. Um, it's really cool because it means that if if somebody comes to this uh, server operator and says like, uh, we we want to force you to decrypt all this traffic from the last year, there's nothing that they can do to help. It's sort of impossible. It's basically impossible, right? Cool. Okay, so that's forward secrecy. Um, we also get, uh, like I said, some, some identity protection from the fact that the certificate is encrypted, but it's really, it's really quite incomplete. Um, so even though a passive observer here can't tell what certificate the server sent, like I said before, it can still tell that you sent all this stuff to this particular server at this particular IP address. And that tends to be pretty revealing. Um, uh, it is possible for multiple sites to be operated on the same IP address, but um, a lot of the big sites just sort of own their, own their own IPs, and so they're the only site that are they're, they're being hosted on that IP address, and so it's pretty revealing if you can see that. Um, although, again, you can't see sort of any of the actual encrypted uh, HTTP data, but you can still tell, ah, this person's connected to Wikipedia, for example, or whatever. Um, or also DNS requests, right? If, you're not, if your DNS requests are also completely in the open, then they can see exactly what sort of DNS lookup you did before you did all this stuff. And so that needs to be encrypted as well. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 really good though. At least there's at least we're not leaking more things than we need to. And then of course we have those sort of one-sided authentication. So the the client is authenticating the server. The server doesn't know who it's talking to. Um, and then I mentioned this like I think really early on in the class, but there's this thing called client certificates that you can do, but no one really does it. But um, in theory, you can you can be you can install a certificate into your browser, and then when this exchange happens, it happens. Um, uh, the the, the um, sending of the certificate happens in two directions. So you as a client can send your certificate to the server, and if the server knows your uh, public key, then it can confirm it's actually talking to you. Um, no one uses this because no one wants to install certificates into their browser. No one knows how to do that. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it, is, it is, uh, is, in theory, possible. Yeah? But is it just possible for someone to steal the like, certificate file itself? They just install it on their browser and like, impersonate you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, think about, um, has, have any, any of you set up, um, uh, what, what is the term for it? It's like, um, I forget the exact term. It's, has anyone set up SSH where you don't use your password, where you, you put a key file um, on the server? You sort of tell the server this is the, the, the um, I forget, you tell it the fingerprint or you tell it the, you, you essentially tell it your, your public key. Uh, and then you have some secret key material on your laptop. And then anytime you connect to the server, uh, the, 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 the SSH server is willing to trust your laptop just purely on the basis that you have this file on your computer. Um, and so, yeah, if that gets stolen, um, you have the same problem. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's still useful. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the adoption of HTTPS. So um, there's this really cool report that Google puts out called the uh, Google HTTPS Transparency Report. And they talk about how many sites they've observed during their crawling of the internet 
uh, that are using HTTPS. And so this gives us some really good insight into how this stuff is being deployed. Uh, and so how many, I'm gonna get some, some uh, hands here. How many people think this number here of sites that work on HTTPS is more, okay, so this is the top 100 sites that are not owned by Google. Uh, so how many do you think uh, work on HTTPS? More or less than half of them? Just right now. Right now, yeah, right now. So more than half? Okay, more, okay, what about more than, th than three-fourths? Okay, more than 90%? More than 95%? Okay, uh, so yeah, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, so I'll just show you the numbers. Uh, we're actually doing really well, so almost all the, the, the top sites work on HTTPS. Um, a few of them don't default to HTTPS, and that's actually a, a pretty big problem. So this number used to be real, these, these numbers used to be really, really bad in the past. It's gotten really good in the last few years, mostly because the browsers have basically threatened uh, to, to print the words not secure next to your site if you don't add HTTPS. And they announced sort of very far in advance, like, hey, in two years, we're just going to, we're going to sort of put this really scary text next to your URL, so you better figure out in the next two years how to get a certificate uh, or, or else. Uh, and, uh, and then that sort of has made, been pretty, pretty effective at making people uh, figure it out. Uh, that combined with Let's Encrypt, providing free certificates for everybody as well. Um, yeah, there's a really funny uh, thread on, on one, of, one of the browser vendors' websites where somebody was like uh, opening a bug saying like, my site's actually secure, how dare you print the words not secure uh, next to my URL, like I have my own security mechanisms. Uh, I'm, I'm unhackable. And then pr very quickly after that, like a day later, somebody like profoundly hacked the guy's site just for saying that. Just pretty, pretty mean, but uh, but also I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, so so uh, that's been pretty effective. These are some of the the graphs they published. So this is how many uh, the percentage of page total pages that have been loaded over HTTPS, uh, and then it's sort of split out by by platform. And so you can see like Windows is somewhere around like 80, 80 90 percent. Uh, for win it's a little bit different per platform just because uh, the types of sites that users on the different platforms go to varies a little bit. Uh, for whatever reason, Linux users uh, like to go to unencrypted pages for some reason. Uh, I don't know, maybe they're just visiting more interesting esoteric uh, sites that, haven't, uh, that are less mainstream or something, I don't know. But anyway, uh, and then here at the very top is, uh, is Chrome OS, uh, so like Chromebooks, uh, and they're, they're um, probably because people are mostly using Google services that are just uh, mostly interacting with HTTPS sites. Uh, and then this is, uh, for, this is just because this is from Google's data, there's a lot of, it's sort of Google-centric here, but this is the number of, of pages from Google uh, services that are loaded over HTTPS. So they're almost at 100%, but um, it's interesting that it sort of levels off here in the last few years where they can't quite get all of their pages to be loaded over HTTPS, which is kind of interesting. So I was looking into that to figure out why it is. You'd think that it would be, possible for them to just sort of say, we're just going to go all in on HTTPS. Why is it not 100%? Um, and uh, oh yeah, so typically people use a few excuses for why they can't deploy TLS. Uh, it used to be the case that crypto was kind of slow to, to do this, to, to run these algorithms on the server, and it would actually uh, delay the, uh, the, it would delay the server sending out the response. Um, that's not true anymore. And um, also a lot of ad networks didn't support HTTPS for a while. So if you were a site and you wanted to deploy HTTPS uh, and your ads were loaded over HTTP, that would cause the lock to break and or maybe the ads wouldn't load in your browser because of mixed content. And so uh, people were sort of hesitant to, loot, to, to sort of throw away revenue. Um, and uh, it took a while for that to not be the case, but that's generally not the case anymore. Um, but in the case of Google, the reason why they, I think they uh, haven't hit 100% is because they have a bunch of users on really old mobile devices which are talking to uh, to certain APIs over HTTP, and those phones are not going to get any more updates. They're just really old phones that are, they're, they're out of support, and so uh, I think they're just waiting for people to stop using those phones. Um, uh, you could imagine they also could just block those requests, but uh, but uh, but yeah, I, th I think I think that's the reason why that number is not 100% right now. Uh, and then I also looked at like specifically what products it was. It was Google News and Google Maps were the two that were that were below 100%. Um, I think maybe just like there's some old maps app and some, and of course news maybe is because uh, some news sites haven't migrated to HTTPS yet. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, and so yeah, that's the not secure thing that you see in Chrome. And now all the browsers have adopted this as well. Um, 
so it's cool. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, um, there's a whole bunch of these CAs, uh, and we have a problem, which is that if any of them are compromised, then uh, the security of all sites on the internet are, are, are compromised, because that CA can, can issue certificates for any domain it wants to, and your browser is going to just trust it. Uh, and we have these things called intermediate CAs, which are uh, CAs which are only a thing because some other CA said, hey, you can be a CA, uh, and signed their, uh, signed, gave them a certificate eff effectively, and then they can now go and issue certificates to any domain they want to. And then your browser looks at the whole chain, and if it trusts uh, the top-level CA, and the top-level CA tells you to trust this as an intermediate CA, uh, then you'll go ahead and trust their certificate issued by that intermediate CA. But that, that they need to be really careful when they issue that because it's basically a flag in the certificate that they issue that says, like, this person can issue more certificates. And so they don't want to give that to just anyone. They want to give that just to people who they want to be intermediate CAs. It's a really important uh, flag. Yeah? Who's they? they? How do you get issued? How do you become one of these 1,200? You just have to go to one of these people I and pay the money. Top oh, how do you become top level CA? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it is just sort of, um, I mean, uh, I mean, really important companies can somehow make an argument for it. I actually don't know the exact process. Um, there's, uh, there's a mailing list where people discuss this stuff and like petition to get in. And there's, um, uh, there's also, um, here, I want to mention a few things. There's, there's so there's, here, uh, uh, maybe I should. But yeah, I, I, think, I think like uh, there's a, an attempt to sort of let every, like uh, different countries have sort of a seat at the table and not, so it's not just so US centric. But, um, but I, I don't actually know the exact process that, that, that is undertaken. I do know there's a process to get people removed, which has happened several times in the last few years, which is really interesting. Um, there's this, this case from 2011 where uh, a, a CA in uh, uh, the Netherlands issued a, a bunch of, uh, I think it was just for Gmail. It was a, it was a fake certificate for Gmail. And uh, this meant that like, whoever had this fake certificate could man in the middle Gmail connections. And it was, this was happening in um, Iran, so like hundreds of thousands of Iranian uh, users who were visiting gmail.com were getting man in the middle. Um, and no one really knows who did it. Um, uh, but you can, read, you can look it up and just sort of read about it. Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, the company that, uh, that, that lost their, the, the company that sort of got hacked and issued this fake certificate went out of business uh, because as soon as this happened, all the browser vendors said, we're going to delete your uh, trust from our browsers. And that basically made them go out of business because that's the only thing they offer is the ability to, <laughs> to issue certificates. So there's actually kind of very high consequences for, for, for screwing this up, which is really good in terms of accountability. Um, this is another weird case where this company somehow, it seems like they emailed the private keys of some of their users, about 23,000 of their users, to, to a random person. And what's really confusing about this is that they shouldn't have the, the private key, the, the secret keys of their users anyway. They should just, remember the, the process I showed, you send your public key to them and then they create a certificate and then provide the certificate to you. And at no point do they see your secret key as a server, right? That's supposed to be kept you know, only known by the server. But somehow they had like hundreds or tens of thousands of, of, of actual secret keys. So it's really unclear what happened here. Um, uh, and then this one is, uh, is, is, is also quite interesting. Komodo is always in the news for, for bad security practices, it seems. Um, but uh, yeah, in this case, uh, one of their resellers got hacked and issued uh, fake certificates for a whole bunch of sites, including like Google, uh, Yahoo, Skype, Mozilla, Microsoft. Um, and the best thing is the quote from the president and CEO. Uh, he said, so as a summary, it's a SQL attack, fairly, co fairly common on a company in Brazil who sells some of our products. Uh, nothing to report, really. Um, so yeah, he basically got hacked so thoroughly with a, with a SQL injection that, that, uh, that all these fake certs were issued and it was like nothing to report. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, and, then, and this is an example of, of sort of um, the worst thing that can happen to you if you're a CA is that the browsers decide that they're going to just remove your trust from, from the browser. And this happened to Symantec recently um, because of a whole bunch of violations uh, that they, uh, uh, they did. Um, they were actually then acquired by somebody uh, who was it? They were acquired by somebody, I think. And um, but anyway, that, it didn't matter. They still got, they still lost their trust. And um, all the other browsers also typically follow what Mozilla does here. So if Mozilla decides to remove somebody, the other browsers kind of all sort of in support, sort of go along with them and, and remove uh, re remove that CA as well. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of discussion that goes into this. It's not done really willy nilly. Now let's talk about an attack on HTTPS called TLS strip. It's uh, often commonly known as SSL strip, 
because that was the name of TLS when um, it was originally released. But now we now we talk about it as TLS. So I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to TLS strip for, uh, throughout the rest of this uh, lecture. So the idea here is uh, most servers implement HTTPS uh, on their servers, and then they redirect all requests that come in to uh, HTTP uh, to the to the HTTPS URL. And so that means that users who accidentally type in HTTP or users who omit the protocol entirely when they're typing in a URL um, will be redirected to the HTTPS version of the site. Um, and that's really useful because the browser assumes that the protocol is HTTP when the user doesn't type anything in. And so, um, you know, this seems good, uh, but what if the attacker intercepts the first unencrypted HTTP request? before the redirect happens, right? So if they do this, then they can man in the middle all the traffic to rewrite the HTML and keep the user on the HTTP version of the site. So what would this look like? So here's a uh, flow of what this might be like. So say that the client makes a request for the home page of example.com. And now the server here sees that this request came in over HTTP and there wasn't a TLS a handshake, and so it's going to respond with a uh, 301 response code, which means to redirect to the location that's indicated by the location header. And in this case, there's also some HTML returned that just says the page has moved. But the browser will ignore this, and will just uh, it will just look at the lo at the location header and just redirect the user uh, straight on through to the HTTPS uh, version of the site. And so this is great. So now the browser will make another request for the same URL, but this time um, it, will, uh, it will first do the whole TLS 1.3 uh, uh, handshake um, you know, mumbo jumbo that we saw before, and, um, and, then, it, you know, and then it sends its, its, its HTTP request within that, and then it gets back this, this HTTP response. And, and again, this, this uh, green square with the lock just indicates that, um, that, that these messages are secured with TLS. Uh, and so you know, everything works out great in this case where there's no, uh, where there's no active attacker active network attacker. Okay, so what the TLS strip attack does is when there is an active attacker, we're going to have um, qu qu quite a lot of, of, of effect on the client here. So what is the active attacker going to do? Well, it's going to see the unencrypted request go through to the server. And uh, remember, this is completely unencrypted. This is being done over HTTP. And so the active attacker can observe uh, all the details of the request. And when it sees this request, it's going to just go ahead and pass it on through to the server. Um, the server is going to respond. And um, if from the server's perspective, again, the active attacker is the client who connected to the server. And um, so it sends back a response saying, um, you know, uh, this page has moved to the HTTPS version. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the attacker there is not going to forward that through onto the client. But instead, it's going to handle uh, that uh, redirect uh, response itself. And it's going to sort of follow up with, another um, request to the server, but this time over uh, TLS. Uh, and then uh, the server sends back a response like it normally does. Uh, and at this point, the, the attacker wants to forward this response that it received from the server uh, on through to the client. Uh, but before it does that, uh, it's going to modify it. And it's going to uh, change the HTML that it sends back. Um, and of course, it, you know. Even though this is encrypted with TLS, this is a TLS session that the attacker itself started with the server. And so, of course, this, this attacker can read this plain text uh, uh, in this response, no problem. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take that plain text uh, response, it's going to take it out of the encryption, and it's going to go ahead and modify uh, the HTML. And in particular, it's going to modify all the links in the HTML. So anywhere where there's a link that uh, is an internal link to the same site, uh, so you know, things like the login link, the link to the different sections of the site, all those links, those are all going to be rewritten so that they point to HTTP versions of the URL. So anywhere where there happen to be an HTTPS URL, those are going to be rewritten to HTTP. Uh, and of course, anywhere where there's a relative URL or an absolute URL, so those are URLs that omit the protocol entirely, those don't need to be rewritten because, of course, those are going to be relative to the page um, uh, that, um, that they're included in. And so anyway, the idea here is that then 
after this strip operation has happened, the attacker sends on the modified HTML to the client. Um, and now the client you know, doesn't know any better that, uh, that this has happened because, of course, um, there's no uh, TLS going on here. The, the, the client made an unencrypted request and got back an unencrypted response, and uh, it knows no better that, uh, that this whole uh, operation has happened. And so, of course, the, the especially damaging part of this attack is that this HTML that it got back, all the HTTPS links have been rewritten to HTTP. Uh, and so, of course, any link now that the client clicks on in their browser is going to go to uh, an H it's going to make another HTTP request, which the active attacker can intercept. And so, here's a, here's a representation of that. So, say now the user clicked on the login link, they want to go to the login page. Um, that request gets made over HTTP. In the same uh, the same uh, steps that we did before, the attacker would do again. So, the attacker will you know man you know will, will will forward that along, get back the login page, and of course rewrite all of the all of the um, uh, links and, and uh, forms and everything to use HTTP instead of HTTPS. And, 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 and in so doing, they can basically force the user to stay using HTTP throughout their whole entire session. Um, OK, so we get an idea here that this is quite bad. Um, all, the, all, the, uh, all the requests uh, have, have had the TLS stripped off of them, basically. And we want to have a way to prevent this so that the client doesn't get uh, man in the middle because of that first request being unencrypted. OK, so the solution to this is HTTP Strict Transport Security, or HSTS. So HSTS lets us defend against the TLS strip attack by allowing the server to tell the browser, no matter what protocol the user specifies, always use HTTPS. So if the user types in HTTP colon slash slash, they leave off the S and they, and, they, and they visit the URL like that, well, the browser will automatically add in the S for them and, and ensure they're always using HTTPS. Um, the same thing is true if the user clicks on a link from another site um, or if they, um, if they even click internal links within the site that are HTTP. The browser will always rewrite those to HTTPS um, when the server has asked the browser to do that. So how does the server ask the browser to do that? Well, it sends an HTTP header. The header is called strict transport security, and you can specify how long you want the browser to remember this preference. So in the header I've written here, where the, this is a header where the server is asking the browser to uh, use HTTPS whenever talking to this server for one year. So the browser is going to have to save that fact, you know, save that bit of information in the browser and ensure that it, it follows that rule for, for the next year. Now, one downside of this header is that it has to get sent to the browser before it can work. So uh, the, the downside here is that th that means that the very first request that we make to a site uh, is going to potentially be unencrypted if the user types in HTTP. Um, because they can't know in advance a priori that they need to use HTTPS until they've gotten at least one response from the server that includes this header. Um, so this is called a trust on first use model, and it's, it's um, it's quite similar to if, if you've ever used, uh, used SSH to log into a server, um, the very first time that you SSH into a server, uh, oftentimes it will, it will ask you to um, trust the fingerprint of the server. Uh, and you can specify yes or no. And um, the idea there is that this is, the, this is a fingerprint of the, that server's uh, public key. And it's, it's a um, way to identify whether or not you're talking to the correct SSH server. Um, so if you're being man in the middle, then you would see a different fingerprint than the, the fingerprint of, of the actual server that you're SSHing into, and you would know not to trust the server. Now, in practice, most people don't actually uh, verify the fingerprint of the server they're SSHing into. Most people just hit yes uh, and move on with their lives. Um, and uh, in fact, this actually isn't the worst thing. Um, if you trust uh, blindly the very first time you SSH into the server, um, and you're doing that from home, or you're doing that from Stanford, or some network that you trust, then that's actually not that big of a deal. Um, you know, um, it's not a, it's not ideal, but it's it's um, you know if you're safe that very first time that you interact with the server, then um, in the case of SSH, it will remember that fingerprint for uh, for forever. And if you if it ever changes, it will warn you very very loudly and prominently, and and uh, refuse to let you connect to the server uh, or to the SSH server. And so um, and so you, you know uh, the idea here is that if you trust. The, the server the very first time you talk to it, you're, you're sort of rolling the dice the first time. But, uh, but if you get lucky and it, and it works, then, then, then you're sort of secure for, for, for the rest of time um, after that. And so that's, that's sort of how this header operates. Um, 
So, um, so that's great. I mean, at least uh, at least once a user has talked to us uh, once, we can make sure that they're sort of safe um, from, from, from then on out. Um, now, one question is, what happens if a user clears their history? Um, they want to you know, clear their browser history, their cookies, all that stuff. Should it also clear the uh, list of sites that have requested um, uh, to always use HTTPS? Should it clear the HSTS list? Now, I mean, if you don't clear it, then you've now sort of kept, you're keeping a list of, of effectively of sites that the user's been to. Um, you're sort of, you know, any 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 of these headers that the site that the browser has received that that it's remembering are are um, you know an attacker or somebody who gets gets hands on your computer can look through that list and figure out what kind of sites you go to, or at least you know figure out the sites that have that have uh, that have set this header, which which will certainly leak part of your browsing history. Um, so you know, it seems like that it, it it would violate user expectations if we didn't clear this information um, when when the user clears their history. But of course, the downside there is that now the next time you connect to to um, any of these sites, uh, this information has been lost, and you can now be, be man in the middle on that very first um, request you know, with the TLS strip attack that we just talked about. So this is an example of a privacy versus security trade-off. Um, and browsers, in this case, err on the side of privacy. Uh, OK, yeah. So, uh, so one solution to, uh, to this sort of trust on first use problem is uh, to use a preload list. Uh, and so this is an idea where browsers can, b br browsers basically offer to hard code uh, URLs of sites which want to always be HTTPS only. Uh, and so the idea here is that you can just tell the browser in advance, uh, hey, even before you've, you've seen this header come back from my site, I'm just going to tell you now that that header is always going to be present. And so just please just preload that into every user's browser. So even before they've been to my server, I can just tell, um, I'm just telling the browser now, just make sure that all those requests are HTTPS. Uh, in order to do this, you have to add preload uh, and, in, and, and include subdomains to the uh, HSTS header that the server sends back. Um, and when you do this, you're basically saying, uh, I, I'm giving permission for the browser to preload this header into, um, in, into the browser. And also, I'm doing this for all the subdomains on my entire site. Now, uh, the way this works is the browser literally has a list. A, it's a source file in the in the code of the you know in the source code of the of the browser um, that is a list of every domain that's opted into this, and it's compiled into the browser itself. So when you download the browser or when you when you buy a new computer and it comes with a browser, that browser includes a list of sites to to always um, use HTTPS for. And so that means that now any of the domains that are in that list are just the user is guaranteed that that the, the requests will always be HTTPS, even if they, if they, if they omit typing that in the very first time. Um, so that's really, really great. Um, so if, if you can, you should do this for all your sites. And um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is it's difficult or impossible to be removed from this list. Um, you can request that the browser you know, vendors remove your domain from, from this list later if you want. But, um, you know, for all the browsers that are already deployed, that our users are already using on their computers, they're going to have if they have, if they have your domain in the list, um, then 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 their browser will refuse to 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 ever load your site over HTTP if you ever decide to go back to serving it over HTTP in the future. Um, uh, and so so you know even if you do did get it removed, you would you would um, you would certainly have users struggling to connect to, to your site for some time uh, thereafter. Um, the way this list is implemented is actually quite interesting too. It's it's a, it's a, literally a URL you can go to. Um, if you just Google HSTS preload, you'll find the domain. You go there, you type in your domain, and the site will actually make a request to the server and confirm that an HSTS header is present, that the max age is at least a year, and that the the, the include subdomains and preload keywords are present. And if if all that stuff's present, then the site will um, We'll go ahead and add your domain to the list of uh, sites to be preloaded, and then you're, um, you'll be added to the list the next time uh, the browsers do a release. And uh, I believe the site's maintained by the Chrome team, but all the other browsers just pull that same list into their uh, source code as well, directly from the from the Chrome uh, repo. Um, and so in that way, you know, this is sort of the definitive way to get your your site into the preload list. Um, yeah, and um, one thing that's kind of cool is certain TLDs have added their entire TLD to the preload list. So uh, I think one example of that is the .dev TLD. So if you buy a .dev domain, then uh, you don't have to add it to the preload list because 
the owners of the .dev TLD have just gone in and added that entire TLD to the preload list. Uh, and so it's impossible to host an HTTP site over on a .dev domain. Um, all those are forced to be HTTPS, which is quite cool. Um, because now, you know, this, you know, it's, it's really nice because now all the different .dev domains don't need to go and, and go through this whole process uh, to get preloaded. Uh, and we can sort of keep uh, this list from, from growing out of control. Um, and so I'm hoping in the future that more TLDs make this, make this call and just, just uh, opt their whole TLD into, um, into the preload list. That would be really great. And so there's lots more things we, we could cover. Um, public key pinning is really interesting. Um, we have guest lectures coming in on Thursday. Emily and Chris from Google Chrome are going to talk a, uh, a lot more about that. And uh, certificate transparency and DNS certificate Authority authorization is something that's, those are both quite interesting topics that you can look into if you're, if you're more interested in this stuff. Um, but there's lots, there's lots of stuff. Uh, we could do a whole, uh, whole class on just TLS. Uh, TLS is, is a really deep um, and interesting topic. But we'll have to leave it there. So um, thank you very much. See you on Thursday.